after originating in Asia, reaching Europe and Northern America, COVID-19 is now quickly spreading across the African continent. Over the weekend, the Democratic Republic of Congo registered its first death from the virus. Now the country has closed its borders and declared a state of emergency. President Felix Chizikedi says the country is at war with an invisible adversary. Public life has been suspended, and the country has gone into lockdown, closing bars and restaurants. And now most flights to and from Kinshasa are banned. In this COVID-19 special, we're looking at how African countries are preparing for the upcoming challenge on their already vulnerable healthcare systems. I'm Janelle Dumala on Thanks for Joining Us. Coronavirus is sweeping across Africa. But the true number of cases is unknown as mass testing has not yet been rolled out. Here's some of the latest information we have for you. The number of confirmed cases in Africa shot past the 2,000 mark on Wednesday. Now the majority of the continent's 54 countries have registered infections. Ivory Coast and Senegal have both declared states of emergency. And South Africa will begin a lockdown starting Thursday. Joining us from Brazzaville in the Republic of Congo is Michel Yao. He's the program manager for emergency response at the World Health Organization in Africa. Also here is Al Edwards. He's a professor and immunologist at Reading University. Welcome to you both. Michel, I'll start with you. What sort of advisory has the WHO given Africa, if any? Uh, the advisory, it, in fact, we went to, uh, through different steps. The first step is um, on, for around the containment phase, is uh, early detection uh, to prevent uh, local transmission as much as uh, possible. Um, so this helps actually to detect the uh, initial uh, cases. Uh, now that we are experiencing uh, local transmission, we have it uh, uh, in more than 15 countries in Africa now. Uh, the next step is how to scale up uh, quickly uh, to be able to contain uh, the actual uh, situation and uh, also to start preparing for the mitigation phase. The mitigation phase is a, a equivalent to a wide community uh, spread that can uh, easily overstretch the health services like what we are, are seeing now in the uh, Euro European countries. Now, virologists are also predicting that African countries will experience their peak number of infections this summer. Now, how prepared would you say the continent is? You spoke of upscaling the capacities, Michelle. Um, I, I would say that uh, the first step, uh, countries perform quite well by detecting uh, the um, sporadic cases that were imported in Africa. But for the next step uh, is where we need to mobilize more and we need more effort. Uh, we need also more support uh, in most of the African countries because it is a step that they will have to deal with hundreds of uh, people uh, needing um, uh, intensive health care while in the actual system in many African health facilities, you don't have such capacity. So they need to think about how to scale up with uh, temporary treatment uh, stretchers, how to get access to uh, oxygen provider and uh, also a respiratory machine, how to get access to protective uh, equipment. So uh, at this level, countries are less prepared because they are lacking these uh, resources. Most of them have developed a preparedness and response plan but the supply chain, for example, is one of the major challenge to fulfill this part that is actually urgent because we are moving toward the wide contamination in many countries already. Now, Michelle spoke there of wide contamination. Do you, Al, see the crisis in Africa reaching a similar level to what we're seeing here in Europe? How would that look like? I think I think that you know that's that's what we've you know I've been thinking about exactly that since way back uh, you know when we were hearing about the outbreak first of all in Wuhan in China um, I think one positive is I think that much work has gone on to try and expand for example diagnostic testing services uh, across Africa and we've learned a great deal from programs to tackle 
big infection hazards such as HIV and malaria. So, for example, simple rapid testing technology is now relatively quick and appropriate to roll out. So we have these sorts of tests here, which can be done without a laboratory. Um, they're not perfect, but they're very um, easy to scale out. What I'm hoping is that what we've learned from those kinds of activities, those kinds of pu pu public health activities, will help to deal with early identification and early containment in these states. But it is a huge problem. Given that we can't contain outbreaks very effectively in Europe, I think it will be the same in any other country across the world. Now, testing, of course, a important part of the response to the coronavirus. Michelle, would you say that people are taking the gravity of the situation there in Africa seriously? Uh, I think most of the um, national authorities are taking uh, it seriously. If we look at all the uh, state of emergency declaration that we will start to um, record in many African countries, they are taking it seriously. The, the next step is really for the whole population. And I'm not sure that uh, they have uh, um, uh, this level of uh, awareness as well as uh, uh, take, uh, taking it seriously in most of the African communities. Uh, there is a lot of rumors going around, including means for, for treatment. So uh, there is a work to be done. And from what we learned from Ebola it is that uh, communities need to be fully on board. And for that, they need to have the appropriate information to increase awareness, but they need to be fully engaged for them to play a role. If we have a community-wide transmission, it's the community behavior that will impact on the way the disease will uh, uh, spread uh, faster within this community. And uh, I think learning from Europe is time now to take some of the uh, measures, public health measures, uh, with for full uh, engagement of the community to at least slow down the spread. And uh, the objective is to flatten the, uh, an eventual peak that will actually uh, allow the control with the existing capacities. Should African countries go into lockdown? We've been asked this a lot. One of the problems, though, with trying to give a definitive answer to the question of whether African countries should be locking down is that the situation is just so unprecedented. We're having to interpret data as it progresses. We'll only really know what measures work best after the pandemic is over, and we can compare what different countries did and, and when they did it and how that affected infection rates and how it affected mortality. What we do know is that even though models show stringent social distancing measures can help slow the speed of the spread of this disease, they won't stop it on their own. Containment measures like lockdowns also have a huge economic and social price tag. So there's no real clear advice on when countries should institute them, but I'm pretty certain we're going to see more of them in the coming days in Africa as well. Could SARS-CoV-2 mutate quickly and reinfect people who already had it? Like all viruses, SARS-CoV-2 evolves over time, collecting mutations from generation to generation. We haven't been studying it for very long, but what we've seen so far indicates that it's evolving more slowly than, for example, flu viruses do, and, and that's a positive thing. Flu viruses mutate so quickly that we have to come up with new vaccines for them every year. The question of reinfection after you've already had COVID-19 once um, is kind of still up in the air. If SARS-CoV-2 is similar to coronaviruses from the same family that we also catch, like, like the viruses that cause colds, then we will develop at least some immunity, but we don't know yet if it'll be permanent or how long it might last. Can mosquitoes spread the virus? No, the virus is pretty clearly not transmitted by a blood. Transmission was one of the first things that scientists looked into after the outbreak began. They examined a range of possible ways that it could be given to others, whether active virus could be found in blood or urine or stool or saliva. What they discovered is that although the virus can be detected in the blood, there's no evidence at all that it could be transmitted by a mosquito bite. So you don't need to worry about catching it that way. Does drinking liquids regularly prevent me from catching the virus? 
This is one of those really insidious myths because it sounds pretty logical, right? In fact, the first person who told me about it sent me something when this was making its rounds on the internet a couple of weeks ago was a doctor. Unfortunately, it's not true. Although it sounds really like a great idea, washing all those nasty viruses down into your stomach where they can be destroyed by the acid, it unfortunately doesn't work that way. Sipping water every couple of minutes is not going to prevent you from getting COVID-19. The only health benefit that sipping that water is going to have is to help you keep hydrated. Now, around the world, celebrities have inundated us with their song and dance numbers, often from home and with mixed reception. But Ugandan musician turned politician Bobby Wine has seen his own take widely shared. It's a music video reminding everyone about how to curb the spread of the coronavirus. Wash your hands and keep your distance. Have a listen. Bobby Wine there, but we're now joined by our correspondent, Joy Doreen Birat. She's standing by for us in Nairobi, Kenya. Joy, we just listened to Bobby Wine's uh, rap slash public service message there for us. What sort of role do pop culture and social media have in getting the word out? A lot, actually, uh, because when we look at the African demographics at the moment, a big population happened to fall between the ages of 35 going down. And this is where the major concern is for a lot of people who right now um, are focusing on making sure that the young people get the message because the older generation at the moment um, does not have access to technology on a large scale and they are or happen to be the most vulnerable uh, demographic when it comes to the spread of the coronavirus or COVID-19. So social media and pop culture is playing a humongous role in spreading the message uh, to most of the young people on the African continent and in Kenya and Uganda as well, particularly. So young people acting as multipliers of the message there. Now that message itself, it seems quite simple. Wash your hands, stay home. But neither of those things are easy for everyone. Indeed, um, access to water is not readily available to uh, millions of people around the African continent, and, and that in itself is a challenge, especially in the informal settlements and a lot of uh, areas, the rural parts of Africa per se. In Kenya today, what the government is trying to do is ask the water suppliers to be a little bit lenient uh, with their customers, um, not push up their bills and also do not switch off their water connections in a bid to help people um, flatten the curve of the coronavirus spread, um, that water will be readily available to the people and that even though they might be having arrears, they're still going to be able to wash their hands and maybe take care of that problem at a later date. And also the government has tried as much as possible to go to areas where there's not enough access to water to uh, sensitize them and also provide water where necessary. Thank you very much. Our correspondent, Joy Doreen Bira, there for us in Nairobi.